We're going to start then. Super. I'd say there's one question about the conditions. One or two questions about the conditions for Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. So, like, what must be happening for that to be the case? And then there's I don't know, two sort of Hardy Weinberg problems. So, it's not um, super heavy on those. Um, so, the deal with Hardy Weinberg is that uh, if you look at a population, you want to know sometimes if it's evolving or not, or you want to care. You want to figure out the frequency of likely carriers. So those are kind of the two things that the Hardy Weinberg is good for. Because if it's in equilibrium, then um, you'd expect the results of Hardy Weinberg calculations to not change over generations, uh, as well as you'd expect them to be predictable. So, where you would do the predicted outcome based off of the, this equation. That's right. So, allele frequency P plus Q equals 1. So, that's just basically like uh, for a, a gene that has two different alleles, the big A and the little a, let's say, um, uh, the frequency or how often you see the big A plus how often you see the little a equals 100% or 1 in, in this case because you're using decimals. Uh, and then when you put those together, you can uh, figure out the genotype frequencies, which are just the probability that those alleles um, come together in different um, arrangements. So the probability of two of the big A's coming together is calculated by P squared, which is just the probability of uh, the frequency of a big A. So it's basically like, how common is a big A? And how common would it be for two big A's to come together? So you just multiply each um, big A, the frequency twice, so that's P squared. Uh, then the Q squared is just how often do I expect the two little a's to come together, which again is just the frequency of a little a squared. And then the middle term here, uh, 2PQ, is what is the like, or what do I expect um, where you get one big A and one little, so heterozygote. And the reason it's two in front is because you have two ways of making a big A little a, right? You can get one from either parent. You can get a big A from mom and a little A from dad, or a little A from mom and a big A from dad. So that's where the two comes in. And again, the P and the Q are just the frequency of the big A and the frequency of the little A. And then, so you multiply those. And then since there's two ways to get it, then you multiply by two. And the reason they add up to one is because um, uh, when you add up the frequency of every genotype, it should add up to 100% of the population, which when you're using decimals is the number one. So that's basically what you're looking at there. And so if you have a population and you know characteristics about it, you can use these equations to say, well, what do I expect the population to look like? Given the fact that there's 99% of the population or 0.99 as big A alleles, uh, or 0.99 of the, of the gene pool is big A, how often do I expect to see a homozygous dominant? How often do I expect to see a heterozygote or a homozygous recessive? So like in that situation, you'd expect to see big A, big A a lot. And so if you have a population where you don't see that, um, then you're wondering what's going on there. And that could tell you about um, the Hardy-Weinberg like uh, conditions, which one is broken. Um, if you know populations in Hardy Weinberg or generally, like generally the global population is in Hardy Weinberg for humans, uh, or even the US population, um, you can calculate carrier frequency because you might know the genotype or the, the allele frequency, like you know what portion of the population has uh, or is the big A, what portion of the gene pool is little a, and you can figure out how many carriers there are, particularly for like a genetic disorder where you're attempting to figure out what the likelihood of someone being a carrier is. Because remember, carrier is just big A, little a, heterozygote, uh, when that's not a phenotype. So the kind of two kinds of, uh, so the issues here, um, how does it get into Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Meaning that when you use the equation, it comes out the same as reality. 
So that's when you like observed minus uh, observed compared to expected. Observed is like reality. Expected is equation. So if these five things are met, or if any of these are broken, we expect uh, the Hardy-Weinberg uh, would not be in equilibrium. So the equation wouldn't match, the calculations would not match reality. So extremely large population size, because as you know, when you have a small population, um, random events, and, and just you know the fact that all crosses don't turn out exactly you know, one to two to ratios or three to one ratios, whatever, you know, you're when you did Punnett squares back in bio one, you had like these percentages or, or fractions that come out of what you expect. But remember that's not 100 percent Just like flipping the coin. So the more times you flip the coin, the more likely it is that you get half heads, half tails. Whereas with the population, the bigger the population, the more likely it is that you have it distributed how you expect. Unless there's something else going on. An extremely large population size also speaks to um, genetic drift. This drift is is more impactful in small populations. This drift remembers random events, whether it's a bottleneck event with a catastrophe, like as in random large quantity of the population uh, is killed, but not because it's less adapted, but just because it does. It's trampled by a moose or asteroid hits or um, a, a flood comes and it's not because certain ones can swim or not, it's just who got swept away at the time. When it's a large population, that's less likely to make a difference. Uh, random mating so that there's no sexual selection, um, which goes along with number four, no natural selection, which we would think of that in this case as um, uh, survival and reproduction, so survival as well. Uh, no mutations because that's introducing new alleles. Uh, I'd say number three is like mutations would arise, but if there's something else going on, they're really not going to make an impact because you have a mutation arise. It's rare unless there's some sort of selection for it. It's not going to actually change Hardy Weinberg very much unless it's a really small population. Um, but uh, that's the mutation part, and then no gene flow because if you have either organisms or gametes um, uh, in like, let's say pollen or um, sperm, eggs, whatever, um, or spores, any of those traveling into or out of the population change the frequencies automatically because they like, literally bring new gene combos or new, new uh, they bring their own versions of the genes and that changes how common they are. So that's the general idea of Hardy Weinberg. So there's kind of two scenarios. One scenario is that I tell you it's in Hardy Weinberg. And so in that case, you can just use the Hardy Weinberg calculation from the beginning. Okay. I'll tell you on the first one. Um, okay, you sampled a population in which you know the percentage of the homozygous recessive genotype is 36% using that 36% calculate the following. Um, and so I probably would not ask you all of them. So you want to figure out like what you're being asked so you don't go solving for all kinds of things you don't need. Um, so in this case, I don't want to tell you that the population is in uh, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so that means if I tell you the population's in Hardy-Weinberg that you know that you can just straight up use the equation. Um, so you know how it's recessive, that's what they told you here. So you gotta figure out first of all what have they told you? Okay. So you know how is recessive, and they can tell you little a little a here. All right, that's little a little a, which you know that remember Q is the frequency of little a, and uh, little a little a is a genotype. So whenever you do genotypes, just remember that you're using the two letter equation because you have two letters in a genotype. When you're doing alleles, which is just like the A, little a, uh, something like that, you're using the one letter um, equation with P or the Q. So if um, our little a frequency is Q, then our frequency of little a, little a is our Q squared. 
It's just the probability of both of them. Okay. And what do they give us? They tell us the homeless rate gets recessive genotype. That's why I had to put this genotype is 0.36. Um, so that's 36%. So I write that there. Um, so let's see what they ask us. That's what we know. Let's say what we ask us. Um, a, the frequency of the a, a little a little a genotype. Awesome. <laughs> that is exactly what we just calculated. So let's put it A. Super. All right, next, the frequency of the little a allele. So know that if you have the frequency of the um, getting two little a's, that means that you should be able to just square it or square root it to get the frequency of one of them. Because remember, q squared, the square root of that is q. That's how you get rid of a square, square root it. So, that's all you hear. You're going to do the square root of 0.36, and that's going to give you Q, which is going to give you points there. So B, the frequency of the little a allele is 0.6, which basically means 60% of alleles in the gene pool. Everyone's Genes, if you threw everyone's uh, DNA into one pot and you looked at how often different uh, gene uh, versions, alleles arose, that's what the gene pool is. So the frequency of the gene pool are little a. That's what that means. So then we could calculate the frequency of the big A allele. So you can just think about this logically. If I guess you should do it too. The original was to two decimal accuracy. So if 0.6 uh, or 60% of the alleles are little A, then the rest must be big A, because this in this case, those are our only two options. And where the P plus P equals one is coming into play. So P plus Q equals one. I got that from here. And in other words, you could even just look at this. So 60% of 0.6 is the little a. That just mean 40% is 0.4 is the big A. And that's the same thing here. So P equals one minus All right, so now we know this is our Q, right? This is our P, this is our Q square. Uh, so now we want to find the frequencies of the genotypes big A, big A, and big A, little a. So big A, big A, P is what big A, big A, or big A is. So we just do that twice, so P squared. Equals 0.4 squared equals 0 0.4. Yeah. Two. One. That means that frequency of almost like it's dominant. Okay. Is sixteen percent. Then you do two PQ, where you just plug in P and Q with two, and that one's going to give you um, forty-eight point four eight. Okay, so instead of solving all of them, let's just do this one. All right, so sickle cell, blah, blah, blah. Uh, normal individuals, or we could say, I wouldn't even use this, but uh, uh, so homozygous individuals have normal blood cells, then we have heterozygous or homozygous recessive, if you want to think of it that way, uh, for the sickle cell trait, have sickle cell disease. And then they're heterozygotes. We know that those are protected from malaria. You guys are familiar with that. 
uh, but they don't have sickle cell. So the question is, if 9% of an African population is born with actual sickle cell disease, what percent will likely be resistant because of tigers? So you don't have to solve for everything in this case, if you want to waste your time doing that. Okay, so 0 0.09, that's not is going to be our genotype, right? Uh, it says, so basically this one is two, so it's a genotype, so this is our Q squared, right? Because two little S's, that's Q, and it's two of them because it's genotype frequency, so that's Q squared. Good, this is what you want to get to. <laughs> so as long as you have Q squared, uh, you can usually figure out everything else. Well, really you want to get to Q. So if you can find Q or Q squared, then you can probably solve for whatever they're asking. So what do we need to do? What are they asking us? They're asking us the heterozygote, which is 2PQ. How do you find Q? You just square root it. And that's going to give you the So if 30% of the uh, gene pool is little a, then the rest of the gene pool must be big A, which is the, you know, uh, P plus Q equals one. But if you just think about it, if 30% is one, then 70% must be the other, which you could plug that in if you need to. So our Q, uh, our P, the rest of it, and now we just need P, uh, two times P and Q, and that's gonna give us 3.42. So if they ask, so the frequency of carriers is probably uh, 0.42 or 42% we would expect to be carriers. So if I don't, we don't know populations in Hardy Weiberg, then um, what we have to do is we would have to have the frequency of the different, we'd have to have the numbers of the different people in the population. All right, so we'll calculate for the expected frequencies. So we can use the equation to calculate for the expected frequencies. And then what we need to see is, let's say, the next year of breeding, uh, are the frequencies actually the same or are they distributed the same? So they give us some numbers here. So what, whenever we have numbers, we can calculate reality. So what does reality mean? Reality means that we have uh, red-sided individuals and tan-sided individuals. Assume that red is totally recessive. So we can just use, I like, Thing. So red, just to remind us, is little a, little a, that's a phenotype. And then we have tan, which is both, in this case, big A, big A, and big A, little a. All right. That's why often you want to get to your homozygous recessive, because there's only one genotype that gives you that, like you know that. So often when they give you a dominant, you can't just use the dominant itself, you have to use the homozygous recessive. Um, so let's start with this number here, the red. So we have 396 individuals. But we want to find a frequency, right? Right? So we want the frequency of red haired individuals. And in the end, that would be frequency of little a, little a. So how do you find frequency? We just divide how many there are of whatever you're looking at divided by the total population. So we have to figure out how many people there are in the population, how many individuals. Nine hundred and fifty-three. So three hundred and ninety-six of those out of nine hundred and fifty-three. A red or little a little a if you divide that you're going to get 0 0.46 so this is where you're doing reality instead of just the equations to begin with yeah okay so that's the frequency of big a big a now you can't just go and say, oh, I have 557, divide that by this, and then that'll give me the frequency of big A, big A, because remember, this is two genotypes. So um, what you'll have to do is you'll have to use this and then use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to see um, what the expected is. So 
So this is reality. Observed. Actually observed this, which okay, necessarily means the observed frequency of little a. So usually that's what you want to get to. We can't do anything with the bigs yet. We just need to find what we can do with this. So if you have the frequency of little a, little a, and remember all the equations we're using are have to do with p's and q's. So we got to find q basically is what you're looking for. So remember, this is q squared. So if we want to find this q frequency of little a, how do you get from q squared to q? You square root it. So if you take the square root of 416, that's going to give you q. So q is. Okay, so that's our Q squared, which means now we know the frequency of little a. Then, just like before, if we know the frequency of little a, the rest of the gene pool must be big A. That's Q plus Q equals 1. So we can plug it into there, but in the end, it's just subtracting from one. So P is the rest of the frequency, the rest of the gene pool. So that's three, five, five. So now we have P and Q and we can do anything we need to. So this is reality. This is the observed frequencies. So if we have the observed frequencies of the alleles, then we can figure out what the expected is, and then we can compare that to reality, like let's say the next generation. Expected means use the equation. And given these frequencies, what do we expect the distribution to be? Distribution that just means phenotype frequency. So you're just doing um, p squared, q squared, and two pq. So the frequency of big A, big A, that's your p squared, and so you just go up and get your p three five five squared. So the frequency of big A, big A you'd expect is 0 0.126. So you expect 12.6% of the population to be homozygous dominant. For heterozygotes, the Q, So you expect 45.8% or 0.458 to be heterozygotes. And if you're thinking about it, you're thinking that I have Q is higher. So I'm expecting more um, often do the two Qs together. So let's say if this number is bigger, because it should be if we're doing it correctly. Q squared is 0.645 squared equals. 0.416, and actually that was from the initial part, we had that number. So this would make sense because we have more of the population getting two, uh, two little a's and less getting two big a's, and that makes sense with how many, uh, or frequency of the alleles. So then what I could do is I could give you a population and say, well, here's, a, let's say, okay, there's the next round of breeding and we get offspring. Um, and you uh, are the is this population in hardy wine for equilibrium? And you just look at the frequency, you look at the real numbers of what you see, and you match it up and say, is it the frequency the same? I could say how many were the different uh, genotype or different phenotypes, and then you could tell me whether that was expected or not. Uh, I could also give you a population, say, 
Okay, so in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, you have 1,245 offspring. So these guys, this generation breeds. We know the populations in Hardy Weinberg, you have this many offspring. And I could say, like, what percent would you expect to be heterozygotes? Or 90%, let's just do more heterozygotes. How many heterozygotes do you expect in a population? So if it's in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, that means we can just use our numbers here because nothing's changing. So to find how many individuals, you just say how many offspring times the frequency of the heterozygote. Since it's not changing, we can just use that number. And so that means we would expect Five hundred and seventy-ish people uh, or individuals to be heterozygous. If I ask you the number of tan individuals, remember this is tan is the dominant type. Excuse me, which is both big gay, gay and big gay low type. So, how many people or how many individuals would you expect to be tan? You'd have to use both frequency of and you'd have to use uh, all of this as frequency. And so, the easiest way to do that really is to be. Um, either do it for both of them or you can do it for the uh, red depends what's easier so if we add frequency of the tan with big a big a plus the frequency of tan but with big a little a Going to equal the frequency of tan, actually, yeah, tan individuals. And then we just multiply that by the population size, and that gives us a number. Can't be a fraction of this people, but so we expect 720 uh, individuals, but 727 individuals that are heads for this one. We expect 727 individuals that are tan for that one. And like I said, if I give you a population and you look at it and it's not what you expect, so it doesn't come out to be these numbers, uh, that is when you're like, it's not a hardy Weinberg. Why? So the strategy there usually is to get to Q. And the only thing is that you can't forget that when you're doing frequency, you have to divide by the total number. Uh, and then the only other thing is when I give you a frequency of alleles, we'll just do this, and then I think should have pretty much gone over what you need. You can either ask your frequency if it's in hardy weinberg equilibrium or what's the expected frequency. So in this case, I'm giving you the number of alleles here. So the key is to remember alleles and individuals are not the same thing. Um, if we want the, the frequency, so we need to first figure out the frequency of the um, ALE in order to figure out the frequency of getting two together, we need another frequency of just the big A. What we want to say is the number of big A alleles over number of total alleles. So the thing you have to remember, we already have 416 on the top, is the total alleles every per for every individual for deployed has two. So each of the thousand individuals has two alleles. So you just have to have two thousand alleles in the population because everybody is contributing two. So 416 out of the two thousand are big A's. That means. 
20.8% or 0 0.208 is the frequency of the big A, what's the frequency of two of them coming together? You just square that. Zero point zero four three three. So uh, um, expect the population to have four point three three uh, percent of in the individuals being big, big, big. Let's do flowers, and so let's say we have flowers that are red, pink, and white, and it's a uh, incomplete dominance deal. But we want to know what's the frequency of the CW allele. And I will tell you that there are four red flowers and six pink flowers um, and eight. White flowers. Okay. So this is the part where you have to, you know, take into account that red and pink have different number or like they're different genotypes. So I want to know the frequency of the CW allele. So basically, you need to know the number of CW alleles out of the total number of alleles. So to figure out CWs, I have real numbers here. So if I have four reds, I know red means two CRs. So for every red, two of the, uh, oh, excuse me. For every red, there's CRs only. So there's none. <laughs> there's none for our reds. They don't contribute any CWs because there are none. For every pink, it contributes one CW. So one for our pink, we have six pink plus for every white, it has two CWs, two from eight of those plants. Total alleles, we know two for every individual. If we add these up, we have 18 individuals. Okay. And in the end, that would be Q if we designate CW as Q. Okay, so does that answer like basically all your Hardy Weinberg questions? Yes. Rumika, are you okay? Good. All right. It was just like literally the whole class said, ah, Hardy Weinberg. So I was like, okay, got to do something. Should we just jump to phylogenies? Oh, everything will be on these. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so basically, if we look at this little guy, it's pretty good. And I tried to, I did include some pictures in here, so that should uh, help jog your memory and stuff. Um, evolution ideas. So phylogeny is, I'll ask you to, you know, read them. Um, uh, monophyletic, polyphyletic, paraphyletic. So basically, like, are you including everybody in the bracket or not? If not, did you grab an extra group? That's polyphyletic. Did you leave off a group? It's paraphyletic. So you can take a look at that again. Um, that uh, we just talked about Harvey Weinberg and gene pool, the five conditions you'd want to know that, like we just said. Mechanisms of microevolution. So you have the, um, actually, and I also have PowerPoints with like, it's a review PowerPoint with graphic, like it says uh, figures or something. So I have some of these, and you can of course make your own. Put micro evolution and then build your own uh, concept map to see if you do you remember everything. Um, here's just like those simple ones to fill out. The micro evolution, right? So we're looking at these. Uh, we detect it by Hardy Weinberg frequency or, or Hardy Weinberg equations. That's how we detect micro evolution. Um, we have 
the, and I would say four mechanisms here of microevolution, I would add sexual selection to this, like we talked about. So we have uh, random fluctuations, right? So that randomness, right, is our genetic drift. Movement of individuals or gametes, that is the gene flow I mentioned before. And then uh, adaptive, the only one that's adaptive all the time is that your natural selection. And then sexual selection is another one. Um, and sexual selection is adaptive in the sense that you shift towards individuals that have mated with more, but not necessarily survive more. In the end, the reproduction is more. Is that why? That's why the population would shift that way. Um, but uh, you know, there's those trade-offs for sexual selection sometimes. So for sure, though, natural selection is an adaptive. I would say selection of individuals best adapted to the environment. Uh, we've got the bottleneck effect when there's a large the catastrophe I was talking about before and only a small portion of individuals that may be a different frequency than you started with. Uh, it could also be um, just a couple of two things. There can be also founder effect where a small group goes out and founds a new population. The frequencies in there might not be the same as the parent population. Uh, and then I'd also add to this probably the um, just random um, fluctuation in genetics, like where, you know, like I said before, the crosses don't always turn in exactly what portions that you think they are, just like a coin flip, so randomness there. So all this stuff is in a more likely in a small population is that drift. Uh, then you have, you know, what happens to within natural selection, you've got the Shifting, so that's directional selection. You have the two um, more extreme phenotypes. That is your disruptive, and then we have um, the one where it selects towards that middle phenotype, and that's stabilizing in the one, the, the middle phenotype there. And of course, why is that? Just due to different selective pressures. Variation comes from mutations, so you have to have variation in order to have any kind of evolution occur, no matter what mechanism, uh, the microevolution, or then macroevolution, there has to be variation. So we've got mutations, which introduce new alleles. Ultimately, that's always how you get the new versions of genes and the new regulatory regions, um, or the new versions of regulatory mRNA, or RNAs, I should say. Uh, you can uh, alter gene number and position. After that, though, typically there needs to be mutations that occur in some of those genes. So I gave examples in the lecture which about that with the different um, receptors uh, because they're all like you can tell they're copies of the same gene, just different variations on it. So that creates variation in the population. Sexual reproduction, that's by mixing up the genetics. So you have like by literally um, fertilization, mixing those. Uh, also with the crossing over in my meiosis one in prophase one, right? Homologous chromosomes exchange pieces of DNA. That's new combos. Um, so we've got the gene flow. Now, only when genes come into the population. So variation, so microevolution shifts in the allele frequencies, genotype frequencies can happen when you have flow in or out. Variation, though, only happens when you have flow in. Otherwise, it's not giving you any new variation. So that's one thing to note. And then horizontal gene transfer, um, you guys now have seen this in more detail than in when we got, went over chapter one. Horizontal gene transfer is this genetic recombination in bacteria. So people might have questions about this as well. I do have a pretty extensive lecture where I drew everything and went over it. So you can look at that again. But the basic idea here is remember those three different horizontal gene transfers. So this is in bacteria. It's different because it's yeah, it's different because it's not reproduction where you generate variation. It's the individual bacterium itself gets something new inside of it and like something gets new DNA and changes as an individual that exists already. So it's it's quite different. Um, you can have horizontal gene transfer in plants as well, but bacteria that has these three that we talked about more extensively. So you've got transformation. That's where you're taking up or the bacteria takes up DNA from the environment. So transformation is from the environment, and then it would uh, cross uh, or homologously recombine. So if there's a part of the DNA that is homologous, 
it can recombine the new version. And so that if it repairs it uh, with the new version, then now it has a different allele in there. So the environment is the transformation recombine into the genome and repair with the new version. So that's the bacterium. Now its DNA has a new version of the gene in it. So that's variation. Transduction is when the virus accidentally transfers. Uh, okay, and then uh, Emily, so then this is the transduction, uh, which is the other one we're talking about. So there's the bacteriophage binds the susceptible bacterium. Now this is the genome of the virus. So this is what normally happens. The bacteriophage. Phage. Okay. So then cells genome that's uh, degraded and the machinery like the ribosomes and stuff make viral copies of the genome as well as capsids, but accidentally it picked up some of that fragmented bacterial DNA. So it's sort of random what it gets. Um, and so then that is in the phage and if it's sliced and goes out, it can affect a new bacterium. So here's the recipient and instead of the viral genome, it's accidentally transferring a bacterial genome. Then if it's homologous, then it can bind, meaning it's, it's like very similar sequence. Um, and then it would have the donor DNA. And so then you have uh, an, a new piece of the DNA in the genome of that individual. And then the last type of recombination in uh, in bacteria is the conjugation. Okay, so this is the donor bacterium. See so that it has uh, the F plasma, so it's making that uh, conjugation bridge. So fluoride is making genetic DNA. There's the conjugated plasmid, which is the F plasmid. There's the conjugation pillus. It's not about that. Okay, so then the recipient bacterium has to be a bacterium that can uh, bind to the, the bridge. And so you get that, and it opens up, pulls it close, and then. It opens up like a passage between the two. So we can see that passage. And then basically it's going to transfer one of those strands over at the plasmid. And each of those is going to make its own new DNA to make a full plasmid. And the bridge breaks. And now you have to, and now the other one, the recipient can now make a bridge and it can pass it on as well. When does this matter? There's a mobilizable plasmid like the R plasmid. So this is a second plasmid that can get passed on. So once it forms the bridge, because it has this, instead of passing the F plasmid or an addition, perhaps they can pass that R plasmid. Or sometimes these don't have to be resistance. They could be um, plasmids with uh, genes on them that allow the bacterium to eat other things. The meaning is recorded, yeah. Um, and so then it builds the new one again, and then the bridge would come apart. So now you have a plasmid in there, which could get, which would give this recipient bacteria new properties, whether it's resistance or whether it's uh, the ability to uh, utilize new nutrients, something like this. So those are the three ways horizontal gene transfer and bacteria can generate variation in that one individual action. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, natural selection can't reproduce perfection. You saw that in that uh, essay, right? Trade offs, what um, mutations are arise. Uh, and the variation that's there you can't force there to be certain variation. Uh, historical constraints, which is what the trade offs to, is that uh, that the changes build off of what already exists. Um, uh, heterozygotes may retain unfavorable alleles in the population because they're not affecting the heterozygote and so that might continue to continue to persist so you wouldn't be towards perfection and then also the environment dictates what's advantageous or not so if the environment changes what's advantageous before might not be in the future so is there there's not really anything called perfect because it's environment dependent ultimately Okay, then we get to macroevolution and speciation. So basically, most common aspect or the most common version of that is 
uh, allopatric speciation where it's geographically separated. So here would be the scenario we'd have a population, a population, remember it's the same species, brood. And whenever we're talking about microevolution, we're talking about a population, like uh, shifting allele frequencies, genotype frequencies. Um, so it's like on a small scale. Uh, so the population can get separated. Remember, all speciation has to have um, some sort of uh, prevention of gene flow. So if there's there's still gene flow, meaning that there's still mating between the groups, then it's not going to uh, we wouldn't expect speciation to happen because they just keep combining again. So it has to be something where there is some sort of gene flow stoppage whether that's physical, like an allopatric, or some other mechanism. So then what happens here is you have um, different selective pressures, right? Different alleles. So number one and two are selective pressures. Um, so natural selection, sexual selection happen. Uh, genetic drift um, can occur, you can, especially the founder effect, because these are different fragments of what used to be the population. Uh, speciation equals macroevolution, I would say. So macroevolution is just evolution on a large scale, and basically it's the process of speciation. Yeah. Different mutations arise in the different populations as well, so that dictates which kind of direction they go. And then you could have original species and a new species, or perhaps uh, two new species, depending on what kind of selective pressures you have. Uh, different species concepts have different advantages. Biological is the mating one. So when the two groups can't mate anymore, that's considered two separate species. Sometimes that's not useful, like in fossil, something like that. So you have to use biological. Um, sometimes with like a polar bear and a grizzly bear, they can mate. But like it would seem very weird to consider them the same species because they are quite different. So you could look at maybe genetics. There's all kinds of, of variations, but biological is like a classic one where it's, they can't mate, so therefore they're separate species. I expect them to fuse back together, the species to one. Uh, okay, so once they speciate, or once they diverge during this period here. There has to be some thing that arises that keeps them separate, keeps them from mating. And so that's what these reproductive barriers are. So they reinforce that speciation, that initial speciation event. So whether they are uh, habitat isolation, like not just temporarily living in a, in a different place, but permanently living in a different place, like the animal lizards that we looked at, they probably, they think they, uh, separated, diverged, um, and then part of what happened was behavioral isolation with the uh, dewlap color and the sexual selection. So depending on the environment, different dewlaps stood out, and so then different ones then had different mating patterns, and so when they came back together, they didn't mate. So that's behavioral isolation. But then there was also that clip, that, that thing where the different um, lizards lived in different parts of the trees, or on the grass or on the twigs. Um, and so that would be a habitat isolation to where they're not crossing paths very much because they're so different or because they live, live in different places. Um, temporal would be mating season, let's say, or mate time of day that flowers open up and close, something like that. Um, mechanical isolation is physical, so it could literally be genitalia or it might be spies, um, something like that. Community isolation, so the egg and sperm have to have the right receptors to be able to fertilize. This is why, like, when you have external fertilization in animals or, like, pollen flying everywhere in um, uh, plants, not everything gets fertilized by it, only the same species, because even if the pollen lands on the flower, if it's a different species, it can't uh, make the pollen tube properly um, or it can't fuse with the egg properly, something like that. Post means that it's after the zygote. So fertilization happens, but then something goes wrong. Whether it's a viability problem, um, hyperviability means it's not very healthy or doesn't survive to be uh, uh, born, if it's born or formed. 
Fertility means that organism, that, that offspring might be fine itself, but it's not fertile. Usually because chromosome numbers are problematic. Or hybrid breakdown means that first generation is okay hybrids, but once the hybrids breed or, or reproduce, then things uh, after a while, basically it ends up being reduced viability for uh, the generations and then it doesn't continue. Uh, so actually, uh, I have a really, really good um, lecture that I did over that. Uh, the different how, or at least sexual selection will work in the context of that, because sexual selection is different. So behavioral isolation with uh, uh, like re reproductive uh, behaviors is different than sexual selection for uh, between organisms in the population, as in the peacock with the bigger tail gets mated with more often, versus speciation with sexual selection here where it's specific pairings. So I have a really good lecture to try to explain the difference between those. So I encourage you to, to take a look at it. I think it's called variations in sexual selection in, or uh, in uh, evolution. It's linked to in um, the unit one stuff. Habitat differentiation, it's not just where they live to a lot of times it also goes along with other reproductive barriers even though they're technically physically could meet they don't often and then it shifts to something else so basically sympatric uh polyploidy is the only one that's like boom one generation different chromosome number now you can't mate with the parent this is that idea that you have to have those barriers in place or else the species will then it won't be technically different species they'll fuse back together um, and why are these different things happening? And that's due to basically how how strong the barriers barriers are between the organisms. Okay, there's certain timelines here. So, um, BYA means a billion years ago. So, Earth was about 4.6 billion years ago. I mean, I'm about, I would just always remember this with about a billion years without any evidence of life. And then you have 3.8, you have some molecular evidence like certain types of steroids in the rock that are only made by living organisms. And well, obviously organisms are living, but only made by organisms, AKA living things. Three point five. We have prokaryotic fossils, so we're sure life existed by that point. Some of light. Two point four. Uh, we've got oxygen revolution, or oxygen levels increase uh, significantly. which causes mass extinction of anaerobic species, as well as thriving of aerobic species, adaptive radiation, because now there's oxygen, so things can diversify quickly, new, new resource, as well as other things are dying off completely, so there's new niches to live in. Then we've got 1.8. First, you care about the fossils. So, really, the first evidence of molecular life to eukaryotes, so that's like prokaryotes to eukaryotes, um, two billion years. That's another way I can remember that too. Multicellular. Carrots. Uh, in the red algae. What appears to be red algae.
Then we have 500 million years ago, which is the same as 0.5 billion. Movement to land. So we've got fungi probably first or along with plants. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, we have animals. Those would be the insects. And somewhere, probably 300,000 years ago, maybe 350, they used to be thought to be 250 or 200, but then they found those fossils uh, in the cave, I believe in the country of Georgia, in Europe, or Israel. Hmm. should know that. But in any case, they found ones relatively recently that were much older. Than um, previously seen. Um, you don't know exactly where they found those, but they're looking like uh, somewhat over 300,000. So we'll just go with that for the moment, which is so you know that that could change somewhat. But obviously, way, way small, like much, much more recently uh, than any of these other events, right? 300,000 compared to 500 million. That's the last thing I'm tracking at least. Um, even like the extinction of the dinosaurs was recent compared to these other events. So this here is under million years. Um, and then you go to 500 million years after that, it's not another 500 million years, but then that's the number, which is useful. So those are some tricks I remember. Say the most important. This, this. I know that's only two of them, but 4.6, 3.8, also 3.5, then you get 3.8 to 1.8. 500 million and then 300,000. Is that good? This is just another view of the timeline just to show you like on scale. So we've got oldest chemical signature of life back here. That's the 3.8 and the 3.5. So that's prokaryotic stuff. Then we've got the oxygen revolution here, where it really increases oxygen. Then we have um, eukaryotic fossils here, 1.8. Then chloroplast, just to let you know. So there was lots of photosynthesis happening back here, but not chloroplast photosynthesis. This is just photosynthesis of bacteria, cyanobacteria, that use those folded membranes rather than a chloroplast. Then we got endosymbiosis here, one of them. Um, the mitosis, the, the mitochondria endosymbiosis happened uh, before uh, eukaryotic fossils. So we've got mitos, uh, endosymbiosis. Then we've got this one, uh, chloroplast. So 3.8, 3 3.5, 2.4, 1.8. 1.3-ish um, here is the uh, multicellularity. Then we've got land plants. That's the 500-ish land vertebrates. Um, that's going to be, you know, your tetrapods moving onto land. Along with plants, the fungi came at the same time with those symbiotic relationships. Uh, dinosaur extinction you can see is way down here, and then genus Homo. That's not even Homo sapiens. That's just all the the their genus Homo 
back here. So you can see how very close that is to modern day, which is at the tip of that timeline. Do we have no Miller Uh, I mean, so you'd want to know the steps of the um, of, um, likely began. So, not massive steps, but you'd want to know that first the abiotic synthesis, meaning synthesis without uh, living organisms involved. So that has to do with the the clay and the polymerization of these compounds that are naturally in the atmosphere, probably in a low oxygen environment, whether that's like a whole earth low oxygen or whether it's like the vents on the ocean floor or it's hot rock near like volcanoes, something like that. So you have um, abiotic synthesis of monomers, which is, uh, Yuri, show, Yuri Miller showed that that can happen. Then you have those building up into polymers. That's abiotic synthesis of polymers. So this is like when they and we can do this in uh, modern days. We can do that in an experimental setup, even with higher oxygen. So this is when you get stuff like nucleobases, which are like nucleotides, amino acids, little sugars, and this is when you start building into molecules like RNA is particularly important. Um, abiotic synthesis of monomers first. So like from methane in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, um, not oxygen, but uh, maybe hydrogen, uh, ammonia, those things would come together and then make um, organic compounds like small ones, like the sugars, the nucleobases, or nucle like precursors of nucleotides. Little fatty acid tails, things like that. Um, then those in like little parts would then need to come together, and those would be where you basically get the polymerization of the um, clay and such, um, which can happen. And we do that. You can see it in nature in the lab. So then that's the second step: is the abiotic synthesis of polymers, like RNA and uh, fatty acids. Those are particularly important ones. Because then you've got these formation of protocells, which they can do in the lab now. Actually, that's relatively recent. Spontaneously, not you know, spontaneous formation of protocells. So basically, you have fatty acid uh, bilayer separating the interior from the exterior, and inside, they some of those uh, monomers and polymers would be um, trapped. Now you have a, a isolated interior of a protocell. And then, which they've also been able to do in the lab, you need some of these molecules to be able to replicate themselves. And that's why RNA is so good because RNA, like DNA, doesn't fold into shapes. It's stable, and it can't do reactions. RNA can do reactions. So basically, if, you have, if there's enough variation, um, there are RNA sequences that can fold up into shapes that then can build new RNA strands. And so if you have a situation there where you have RNA that can both be a template and the other strand folds up and copies the template, then all of a sudden you have basically copying of genetic material. Now it's not coding for genes yet, but you have copying. So that's the third step here. You need um, replication of genetic material replication of the um, molecules inside. Obviously, other things have to happen too, but those are the final basic step. Abiotic synthesis of monomers, abiotic synthesis of polymers, protocell formation, and then you need some sort of enzymatic uh, or, or reactions to build new polymers. Self-replicating, we talk about self-replicating.
Uh, uh, as you know, continents move around. It's called continental drift. It changes the environments, which then literally changes where organisms live by moving them, and then also changes the environments by having less coast, more coast, uh, mountains form because things crash into each other, uh, rifts form because the Earth makes faults and separates, so you get all these geological changes, which then changes how uh, the biotic, I mean, the living, the biology uh, changes as well because the environment's different. So just to realize the closeness of biology uh, and how, the, uh, you know, biology especially on a large scale, happens as well. It takes a long time for species to recover from mass extinctions. That was recovery would happen, but it's long, it's a long, long period of time, which is why we're so worried about mass extinctions today. Also, I should mention from ecology chapter that the biggest threat, all right, well, Let's say two. I'm not sure about ranking. It might still be the biggest one, but uh, one of the really biggest threats to uh, for extinction and poor species is habitat loss. Um, you can see just around Houston how much they take down all the time. Um, and then also climate change, though, because that's changing quickly the environment. Quickly in the evolutionary sense, right? I mean, like on our scale, we're like, oh, it's not that fast. But if you look at it on a global time scale or like a, a you know deep time time scale, it's very fast to change. <coughs> so shifting environments. I don't know about switch. Okay, let's um, let's just make this happen. So I told you that I would tell you the timeline, and then I also told you I'd give you the phylogeny. So let's do that, and then I could talk about some of the diversity as we do those anyway. Um, get the right step up. Okay, so I'm not going to have you literally draw any of these, um, but you need to know them. You will have to fill parts out. You will have to interpret sometimes. So that's my chat. We've lost you. It's important. Chat. How long till Earth is inhabitable due to temperature increase? Um, for humans, you know, technology, okay, it depends where you live, partially. Um, technology allows us to overcome a lot of things ourselves, but when the environment collapses, like the ecosystems collapse around us, uh, especially with weather pattern change, or climate is a big scale, right? When we see weather, weather is our day-to-day, -day, um, which is different. It's a really short time that we're seeing those changes or that 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 you know weather. Weather is not climate. Climate is like big picture. So problem is for humans is when other diversity goes down and changes that then it really does affect us. You can even see it now with the emergence of diseases like uh, COVID-19, the SARS uh, CoV-2 or CoV-2. Um, why is that? I mean, part of that is because of human encroachment on, um, as a population, on um, areas where bats just lived before, and this is with other animals too. And so, when humans have more interaction there, because we're taking over that space, and this is more like the, you know, taking away the, the land for animals to live, um, that starts to cause the interactions more, which transfers things. Um, so when you have, you could have more shifting like that, right? There's a lot of concern. 
that the, especially for Texas, since we're already quite hot and we have a good environment for a lot of these mosquitoes that carry uh, different viruses and, and um, uh, like we've seen West Nile in the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years, like come here and it wasn't here before. Um, we've got the, uh, the Zika, which is not here yet, but we have worries because it's in South America. And so it could very well move here because there's different genus or species of mosquitoes in particular that carry these different things. Um, so will the environment where those things live expand and therefore impact other places, the US, that kind of thing? Um, and yes, you know, we do have technology, but it, it has limitations. It also takes time. So as you can see right now, even though we're going to get a vaccine, Taken a year, which is incredibly fast. There's also trade offs like spraying for mosquitoes, selects for resistance. There's only so many things you can do. So I think those are, I'm not, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not expert at all on this. I don't think our biggest worry is too hot of a temperature to live for us. I think the biggest worry is the, um, and not even necessarily too hot for most organisms to live. But the fact that it changes the environment so much to make it much drier, um, to make some places literally shrink for the, uh, the levels of water to rise because the ice caps go down. That's what I think is our uh, major threat right now. That's you know, my best understanding. So what do you need to know for phylogenies? Um, okay, let's just start big and go small. So these are the biggest groups, biggest groupings that we have. And there's three major domains. Um, as you saw, there's a lot of uh, oh, exchange of DNA um, between all these in the beginning. So. It's not pretty like this, but it's too difficult to draw with the crossings. I will draw two of these though. Okay, the, the least related. Uh, the bird. ancestral life or sometimes call it like uh, it universal common ancestor last universal luca last universal common ancestor yeah anyway um so that's what we're looking at for divergence uh prokaryotic cell um so then we've got the bacteria later diverging are the uh, archaea and eukaryotes I'm going to put eukaryotes here. Eukarya is the domain. Archaea is the domain, and bacteria is the domain. These two events here. Those are the endosymbioses. Both of them are primary. So anytime you see a bacterium involved, it's primary endosymbiosis. And I'll distinguish these two events in a moment. So primary endosymbiosis, in this case, we have an alpha proteobacterium. Get engulfed, that's aerobic. Meaning it can use oxygen and ultimately make ATP. And that eventually evolved into the mitochondrion in eukaryotic cells. Uh, it probably was engulfed by like a proto eukaryotic cell, not a full eukaryotic cell yet. But it happens in early life. It happens in all. As far as we know, All eukaryotic lineages, meaning types of 
you know, divergence and all that come from the ancestor, the single, the cell that this happened to is so advantageous for the ATP. It's like uh, based off of mitochondria and mitochondria der derivatives that all of the, all of them look the same. Another primary endosymbiosis event is the formation of the chloroplast that is not from the proteobacterium, but it's from the one that does photosynthesis, which is called cyanobacteria. So I'll say by a cyanobacterium that eventually they are mutually dependent on each other. And this is the chloroplast in the RRQ plastid lineage. The chloroplast in others, but that's from secondary. So chloroplast in RRQ plastida. And I'll show that in a moment. And just let me know if I need to go back. Uh, for bacteria, um, Uh, you would want to know the characteristics of the groups. I don't need you to know the branching of the groups, but the groups that we talked about, you do want to know those characteristics like uh, the cyanobacteria. Are the ones that do photosynthesis, ones that turned into the chloroplast. So I'm going to say this oxygen. Um, Pretty much for them. The table that this is where you want to get this from is there we go. Okay, figure twenty point two zero. You do not need all all the details. You probably want to go look at the old exam uh, to see the kinds of things I asked about the groups. But it's got the proteobacteria. You don't need to know the specific groups except for the alpha proteobacterium, which is the one that ended up in the mitochondria. Lots of proteobacteria. They're all gram negative, uh, highly diverse. So they have um, the one that ended up as mitochondrion. We've got the ones that are part of the mycorrhizae. So that's nitrogen fixation. We've got uh, other nitrogen fixers. Soil. This one has um, yeah. E. coli. Salmonella, Shigella, so basically like all those things we looked at in our lab practical that are gram negative. That's those. Then you've got the chlamydia group. 
uh, which is the STI or STD chlamydia, um, lives inside cells. The one we looked at. Dark Prime. Lyme disease. Should me um table for you in a little while. The, the grant positive. Obviously there's a gram positive. Hmm. So look at your table. Bacillus anthracis. And um, Australian. Let's see something. Okay, here we go. Just do this so that you're not spire keats gram positive. I'm sorry, that's another group. There's five groups. Well, we're going over five groups. Yeah. Let's look at the ones that you want to know in more um, detail, detail, but somewhat more detail. So you don't have to know everything from your lab practical, but you would want to know the following. Okay. Let's make a table. So I'm gonna focus on the ones that are disease causing. So this is probably the most important to you in general life, uh, as far as the ones you need to know specific, like um, species or genera. So, uh, so one disease. Just mention this one. Disease. So you would want to know the name Borrelia. I won't make you write it this time. What carries that one? The ticks? Not all ticks, but you're particular, which carried by deer and other some other organisms as well, perhaps. But um, those are the ones you want to check for after you go hiking. Um, and just remember, ticks are arthropods, specifically. But cholesterols are not actually insects. They're in the spider, millipede, centipede, scorpion, uh, tick, mite, bushy crab. Um, other that they are spirochetes, which you mentioned. So that's a specific genus you want, or species really you'd want to know. Another species is the one causes anthrax. Just write that one down. Bacillus anthracis. Anthrax or anthrax poison. This is a 
bioweapon. I don't have anything. Back to here. Not gram positive. Which means that if you gram stain it, it's purple. It's not actually purple, but uh, it's stained. What does that mean? to the glycan layer that traps the gram stain. The cell wall. And the shape is bacillus, the rod, uh, makes endospores. This is those dormant states. Little resistant packages, basically, of the genetic material that could then uh, reform back into the bacterium or transform back into a, a functioning bacterium after the um, conditions improve. Infection. That's pretty common. Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, there are multi drug resistant versions of Staphylococcus aureus. We can call them strains, and it is strain. Not strand, strain. We call them MRSA. Um, there are other resistant drugs, they're resistant to other drugs too, ones, but methicillin, which is a drug, resistant Staphylococcus aureus, so that name, name comes from. So that's a, a strain of Staphylococcus aureus that can cause resistant staph infections. Or you can't treat them with any drugs or very, um, at least not methicillin. Botulism, tetanus. Of part of the Clostridium genus. If you know just Clostridium, that's enough for me. It's just Clostridium botula, botulinum and Clostridium tetani, but I'm okay with Clostridium sp species. That's not the species, though. That's the genus. Uh, Uh, well, let's just say just like bacillus amphrasis, they can form endospores. This is why you don't want to feed babies honey. We use small amounts of, or have small amounts, no, they don't produce the bacteria, but there are small amounts of Clostridium botulinum in their colonies, and then it gets into honey. It's very small, so it doesn't bother adults, but with small children under, I think it's two, I think, SDH, uh, it can be, uh, because they're so small, it can be poisonous. By poisonous, I mean, Paralytic. 
So food poisoning, but not just like my stomach's upset or I have diarrhea or something like that, or I'm vomiting. Food poisoning where um, you, you're paralyzed. So that's a little bit different. And your diaphragm can't work after a certain period of time. And this is just because of uh, toxin they produce. So this is especially canned food you have to be worried about. So you don't want to eat the puffed up canned food or can that puffs up, especially home canning. Don't eat that. And even heating is not going to help because of those endospores. So they're resistant. Last specific one. Okay, chlamydia is the disease. The genus is also called chlamydia, and the large group is also called, like, the kingdom of bacteria, also called chlamydia. Um, sexually transmitted infection. For get treatment. That's important. A different bacterium, but just to maybe how this works. Uh, gonorrhea is also an STI. Uh, it has some drug resistant strains as of late, so it's really important that you don't get those. It can be prevented by kind of usage or not having sex. Definitely won't get it then. Uh, but it can be problematic. Uh, it's also important to get ST, uh, ISTB tested so you're not passing those things on. And there's lots of strains that are treatable. And you can always have symptoms. All things to keep in mind. Okay, cool. Those are the bacteria uh, groups that I want you to know. I know sometimes people want to know what specific things do I need to know about, or like which specific species do I need to know? And uh, these are the, the ones for bacteria. Okay. I don't think this is written any other place. You want to know chemoheterotroph, you know, photoheterotroph, photoautotroph, chemoheterotroph. So just know the source and the energy source for those. And what kinds of organisms. So I'll give you like scenario being like, okay, there's a fungus living or shelf fungus living on a dead log. Um, what's its uh, environment level? its role in the ecosystem and be like, ah, dead log, fungus, decomposer. Um, sure, can I briefly go over them? And then um, uh, I could also ask you what kind of nutrition mode is it using? And you'd say, oh, it's eating something and not using the sun. So it's a oh, heterotroph. So <clears throat> so here's your here's your uh, this is from oh I don't know, chapter forty or something forty two something like that. Um, but you've got your nutrition modes. Also, might actually have it in the bacteria chapter. 
Um, and the nutrition modes are either you make your own food or they, they have it on period, like, let's say 24.1 major nutrition modes. That's good. Okay, so if your energy source is light, that means your photo. And if your energy source is some kind of molecule or metal, like a molecule or ion, then your chemo. And basically with the chemos, they're getting um, electrons to do their cellular respiration from those compounds. And for the photos, they're getting um, light energy is allowing them to usually photosynthesis. And then the second part, the autotroph, means that it can build its own food. Um, the photoautotrophs that's using CO2 in the atmosphere, so build its own food means that it, it can use carbon that's inorganic. Well, yeah, inorganic types of carbon. CO2 in the atmosphere, so like plants, photoautotroph, uh, all the algae, the photosynthetic or the photoautotrophic eukaryotes, so red algae, green algae, brown algae, um, diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates, uh, euglena, so, so euglenids, um, all of those guys are photoautotrophic. Then there's other ones like certain chemoautotrophs. Those are going to be things that like H2S, so it lives down in the sulfur vents, bacteria. Um, uh, they can also use sodium, or they can use bicarbonate ions. So, those are kind of uh, rock eating bacteria that use the iron, ammonia bacteria. So those are kind of more unusual bacteria uh, or organisms that are chemoautotrophs, but not entirely. They tend to also be able to live in, uh, they live in dark environments. So they don't need light. No, not eat, I don't take that back. They do live in dark environments because they don't need light, could live in light environments, but um, they also, yeah, they don't use other organisms. They use carbon from the environment. Photoheterotrophs are going to use light, but they also need to eat to get their carbon. Then there are other sorts of bacteria. Chemoheterotrophs are very common. They eat to both get their electrons and to get their carbon. Um, then you have the uh, ingestive or ingesters of chemoheterotrophs, animals. Animals are ingesters, meaning they take the food in, whether it's liquid form, whether it's in small chunks, whether it's in little pieces of pollen, anything like that, but they digest it in their body system. So even if they like, uh, uh, you know, put their stomach out there and get it in, like a, um, starfish, some starfish sea stars can do that, still it's, it's digesting inside, versus absorptive chemoheterotrophs, that do absorption, that's going to be your uh, fungi. The fungi secrete the enzymes. It's broken down outside and then taken in after breakdown. So those are two types of chemoheterotrophs. There's also like amoebas, a chemoheterotrophic, um, some diaphagulates. Euglenids again, because those ones are, you know, mixotrophs, so they do, they're both like chemoheterotrophic and photoautotrophic at the same time, or switching. Um, a lot of the parasites are going to be chemoheterotrophic, mixotrophic. So uh, the ones that I know that are mixotrophic, that the, like from our book, are euglena, euglenids. So it's, in the old group of excavates, um, get a picture of it. Like this guy here, like more excavata. But Euglena. So it has both a chloroplast in which it, from secondary end of symbiosis, from which it can do uh, be photoautrophic and make its own food, but it also has the ability to hunt and can take in the own food, especially if there's not sunlight. Like a classic mixtrope. It's uh, the only mixtropes I know are uh, 
protist, so eukaryotes. There are certain animals that will eat plants and then store the chloroplasts. So the chloroplasts like are in their skin or in their body and they're still for a little while making food. Which means the animal doesn't have to eat externally because it has the chloroplasts, but those are only around for so long before they have to eat more food. So I would not consider those mixotrophic. Make sure you go back over the parts of bacteria, you know, flagella, pillus, fibri, fibri, uh, plasmids, you know, ribosomes, that kind of stuff, the cell walls. Ribosomes are, um, so the question is, what are ribosomes? Again, ribosomes are the parts of the cell that's in all cells that are the site of um, uh, translation. So the site of polypeptide uh, construction, putting all the amino acids together, which then eventually fold and assemble into proteins. So the ribosomes are those organelle or the cell parts that uh, are the sites of, of protein synthesis. We can, we can say. Because bacteria don't have too many parts. Like they don't have a lot, they have some simple, certain species, sacs and membranes, like the ones that are cyanobacteria, but they don't have ER, they don't have like vacuoles or chloroplasts or mitochondria, you know, they're relatively simple. Um, but they do have ribosomes to make protein, they do have genetic material in the form of DNA. Sometimes they have simple uh, sacs that have specific functions. The ones that uh, are doing photosynthesis, the cyanobacteria have plasma membrane really, really folded inside. But still relatively simple. Obviously very successful though. I mean, viruses are even more simple than bacteria and don't have to be complicated to be very good at uh, replication, reproduction, existing. I don't want to say living, viruses are alive, but existing. So this allows me to go through the categories as we do it too. So that's the bacteria. Um, then let's do the domain. Um, and I guess for archaea, basically methanogens are a type of archaea that meth make methane. Um, some live in extreme environments, a lot don't. Yeah, in your all over the place as part of the microbiome, they're in the soil, they're in the ocean, kind of like everywhere. But some of them are, are the more extreme environments in the hot places in the you know, sulfur vents and stuff like that. They're single cellular, also prokaryotic with no nucleus and no comp like no complex membrane bound organelles. I don't need you to know the specific groups of archaea for our purposes. We didn't have this on the test, so I wouldn't put them on this. Right here is a thick Okay, so you um a really nice lecture about this. Sure, the symbiosis phylogeny. I'm just gonna draw a little bit of a tear. So this is in eukarya to show the origin of chloroplast, the secondary origin. So Archaeoplasta, 
mentioned before, uh, which are the plants, the, the land plants, green algae, red algae, blockophytes. They're the ones, chloroplast. came from the primary endosymbiosis of the cyanobacterium, as we talked about before. Other groups in eukarya, besides those, like the eugalids, like uh, diatoms, They get their chloroplasts from archaeoplastic groups. So some of them, red algae got engulfed, red algae, multiple times. That's a type of archaeoplastid. Sometimes the green alga got engulfed, and this is not unusual, right? Because like that's how they eat a lot of times, they engulf other organisms, but usually they break them down with their lysosomes. Uh, but then in some cases that didn't happen and they became dependent on each other with the transfer of genetic information. So both of these, these types of plants here, remember, all these are eukaryotic already. <clears throat> So examples of secondary endosymbiosis events. Many times in the history of life. So we see secondary endosymbiosis happening. Repeatedly. So all the other eukaryotic lineages that have chloroplasts, besides Archaeoplastida, have it from a secondary or tertiary or maybe quaternary event. So basically they just keep engulfing each other. Uh, other one photosynthetic. Really the uh, in a red alga. Uh, just also there's another primary event. See it on the other symbiosis phylogeny, but there are other primary events uh, for the chloroplast formation um, to make cyanels, like uh, in some of the the chloracnophytes and things like that. So at least in the pollinella, I'll say that. So in the lineage of um, Circozoans, that's what I want to say. In the lineage of circozoans, there was another primary endosymbiosis event. I guess I'll just put that in here. Just to be aware that primary ha happened multiple, like the chloroplast or, or primary. I think our book calls them cyanels. Uh, um, there are other names as well. So it's like a chloroplast, basically. So uh, another event there. So a few lineages, or maybe one or so, like that. But most of the other ones got it from secondary. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Hmm. 
Okay. So I put my paper up and down for this one. The book has Seattle, but from my reading of, as of late, uh, uh, we're going to call this other. It's a lot of different groups that don't seem to group all together. But things in these groups are going to be a lot of your parasites, Giardia, Trypanosoma, Trichomonas nationalis. Let me write those in a moment. This is all just like relative branching uh, along the lineage. It's not uh, like where it happens on the left and right compared to the different groups doesn't mean anything. I'm just trying it. Drawing this is a polytone. I'm just going to draw it there. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to put this. Further down, whatever. Okay, so this is the star clade. All right, we've got our diatoms. We have brown algae, algae. There are stromata piles. And their basic character or their classic characteristics for a lot of them, at least some form of their life, or at least uh, their gametes have two flagella. One is um, hairy and the other one is not. But if I were to give you a table and tell you some characteristics and I say, oh, it has a hairy flagellum, you'd be like, ooh, stramina pile. Maybe this is a diatom or a brown alga. Uh, then we have, and I'm not, I don't have all these groups. I'm just telling you the ones that are important to me. Plasmodium and other. They have a bigger name, AB complexins, but don't worry about that. Just no plasmodium. Silly, it's. Dinoflagellates. These are the A of SAR. And their classic characteristic that I would give you as a hint is very representative. But have these air sacs, alveoli, and their membrane. Under the plasma membrane. So that's the hint there. And that last group of the SAR is the R, two groups I need you to know. And like there are some other groups. The Rosaria, rhizomes root. And that's because they have general thread like pseudopodia any ones instead of amoeba has you know lobe these are thread like
So if this was its helps itself, uh, and it typically has some sort of shell fish outside test. Forums. Calculus. That's what I need to know from as far as that phylogeny goes. That's the R. These do not have to be in this order, of course. So I'm drawing as a polytony. Our plastida, which we mentioned. So make a morphine. Primary and symbiosis of say, the cyanobacterium. Okay. This is how I'm doing this one. And you can see how specific I need you to know them. Um, Rockophytes are their group. Monophyletic. They're important because they have that uh, peptidoglycan in the chloroplast still. So it's very good evidence that the chloroplast came from bacteria. Analogy. At the kind of major group that's called sporophytes. It's K sound. Carophytes. Phyton is plant or plant like. I put them in quotes because they are polyphyletic, meaning that they don't all form their own. Uh, goal posts, like they all form their own plague to reach back. They are more closely related to other things besides other chlorophytes. Like some green algae are more closely related to plants than they are to other green algae. But they are useful descriptive categories and people use them still. So I'm going to have us know them because it's useful. Okay. Chlorophytes, carophytes, and our embryophytes. Are plants and plants. The snake morphine, you don't need to know them for the other groups, but for the embryophytes, the number of them, the name comes from uh, their dependent embryo, meaning they have an embryo that uses parental nutrition, whether it's in the parent or just in parent tissue. Dependent embryo. It's important. Oxy cuticle doesn't dry out. Land plants can move to land. Apical meristems, where they grow. The tips of the roots and shoots. Uh, sporopollenin. In spores and later in pollen that uh, prevents drying out. So it's a lot of you know, don't dry out. Dependent on embryo, embryo don't dry out. Waxy adult plant don't dry out. Squirrel pollen, spores, and pollen don't dry out. That's because they are all on land. So that's our embryophyte group.
and we'll expand that in a moment. And there's two major uh, groups within the Unicanta. I'm just going to go very broad here. And then we have a double. Zones, so that's like slime molds, uh, lobe amoebas, like Proteus, the one that you probably think of as an amoeba. Lobe amoebae. Okay. Um, this one is it's the pod. So then we've got our fungi, our nucleoids, nucleoids, and then we've got our animals, and we have our so a moment. Oh, and our flagellates. And remember, everything's called a protist, except for animals, fungi, and embryophytes, which are land plants. So it's like a highly diverse kind of random, not random, random, but sort of random name to be like, well, these are other. If you get any of dysentery or something like that, um, Uh, those parasitic amoebae are also amoebozoans. All right, those are the those the eukaryote groups, and within this, we kind of reviewed some of the uh, protist groups. There we go, as well. Ten. So let's go over embryophytes. Check out. Seems like most people feel pretty good with plants, so that's good. Uh, of course, this is when in archaea, plastida. Archaea means ancient, so ancient plastid, ancient plastids come from the chloroplast. Archaea, closest relatives are. Uh, green algae, the um, carophyte, the carophyte green algae. So these are the groups I want you to know, and the detail, uh, the, the level of detail I need you to know for their names and stuff. Some of them are just general names because I think that's sufficient for our purposes. So this is the plant diversity, and when you the um, phylogeny, you'll also be able to tell the um, the snake morphies are going to tell you that a lot of the information about plants that you need to know. I'm going to do those in red. Even if you can't see the red specifically, uh, you're not really missing any information. Everything's there. It's just the blue is so close to the black anyway, so it's either red or green because yellow doesn't show up. So, all right, we said before dependent embryos live within um, and by protected and nourished by parent tissue. And then the other one that's really important is the 
spore pollen. And that's it. These are both things that are land plant specific. So none of the green algae have these things. Uh, and that's like a drying out, prevention of drying out. So this is all land plants have this. So the first three groups, they are not a phyla, they're not a monophylum, <laughs> they're not monophyletic, but they are characteristically somewhat similar. Like the liverworts, we've got the mosses, we're just doing general names here, and we have the hornworts. Don't you know, I need you to know the official names. Um, and these are called bryophytes. Um, which are non-vascular plants. They stay small because they don't have the vasculature in order to transport water and minerals very, and, and nutrients uh, like Sugar is very far around, so they're small. Still live close to water. These guys have a uh, sperm that swims. See if I can get this. Another group that's not we have another kind of class that's not monophyletic either, but has similar characteristics. We have um, uh, what's different between hornworts, mosses, and liverworts. Let's go back here. Here. This is the new characteristic for the rest of these groups, just not in those, and that's going to be our vascular tissue. And that's why they're called non-vascular. The rest are called vascular plants. This allows them to grow larger can move with nutrients and water minerals around the body better. Um, vascular tissue is the xylem and phloem. It's phloem too, it's not phloem. If you look at the word phloem, like flow, flows through the body. Xylem and phloem. You need to leave some room to write other things here, so FYI. The vascular tissues. Uh, they have true roots now, which also allows the better acquisition and movement of um, substances. So this allows them to grow taller. Uh, they also have, have a dominant sporophyte. Stage of life, meaning that the sport fight is the one that you see. And that's true for all the rest of them. Not that you can't see the other ones, but that's like the bigger plant. So, like uh, the flowering, the flower part, that's the opening, the plant that you see, that's the sport fight. Uh, the tree that you see, that's the sport fight. The fern that you see, unless you're looking for tiny, tiny, tiny ones under the microscope, that's the sport fight. So, that's all. Uh, whereas on the liverworts, like if you see moss and it's that fuzzy green stuff, that's the gametophyte. Sporophytes, the smaller projections off of it. Okay, so we have these groups here. We have the lycophytes. So the lycophytes. Uh, for example, club moss, not a true moss. Mm 
<laughs> these do not have true leaves yet, though. We call them microfills. So now the rest of them have megafills. And this group are horse tails and ferns. Um, horse tails and ferns are referred to as manilophytes. That's the modern term for it, manilophytes. And both of these groups together. In a bracket. Both these groups together are called the seedless vascular plants. So shocking, the next one of the next uh synapomorphies that arises is seeds. And these other groups, but now the new one is seeds, and the other really important one is a pollen. Both of these, uh, oh, I should say seedless vascular still has sperm that swims externally. They don't have pollen, so the sperm just swims. They have seeds, so their embryos are still uh, retained in the parent, um, instead of parent tissue that's separate. Seeds and pollen, these are important for moving to a drier environment. They prevent from drying out. So now we see the plants moving further onto land. Okay, and then I'm going to branch our last group. So we're going to have a branch of four. Now I could draw these in any order. I could draw the four at the bottom. It doesn't have to be up here. It's just that um, I want to draw it to where I have some room at the bottom to write, but there's no Remember, it can rotate around its node. So here's the node. So it could rotate around that. Here's a node. So I can have these groups up above. So just remember, you're looking at branching, not up and down order. Please don't just remember up and down order. So this group here, uh, well, let's drop the one at the bottom. The one at the bottom here um, that I have by itself, although there are subgroups. Uh, so angiosperms. So it includes the monocots and eudicots. This other group. Has four subgroups, the cycad. Cycads are all over Houston. Um, if you look at those pictures in the book, I also have pictures in the lecture um, that I did. And uh, they're called sago palms here, but they're not actual palms. Palms are uh, produced fruit, um, coconuts or dates, things like that. But cycads do not. They're actually a very old lineage um, of plants. Ginkos, there's one species left, although they were more diverse in the past. There's nidophytes, cap a silent G, like gnat, nidophytes, Wallichia, Hedra, some of them live in quite dry environments, and conifers. So, like firs, pines, um, like juniper trees, or juniper bushes. Junipers, so even though they call them juniper berries, they're not actual berries. They don't have the seeds inside of them, which is what a fruit has. Uh, and this group in general here are called the gymnosperms, which means naked gymno seed sperm. The naked seed, because their seed is not in a fruit. Angiosperm, again, sperm meaning seed. Angio means uh, Vessel, like a, you know, um, angioplasty. You talk about like your blood vessels and stuff. That's it has to do with that. In this case, angio is the vessel that holds the seed, which is the fruit. Jim have naked seeds. Okay. So, what are these characteristics of angiosperms? With three, one is uh, angiosperms are flowered plants, so they have flowers. Flowers help with um, efficient pollination. Uh, the ones that have pollinators um, and more efficiently transfers directly to the flower instead of the wind going everywhere. Also, fruit 
So anytime you see a flower, there's always fruit and fruits. There's always flowers. Fruits made of the ovary inside of it are the seeds. Seeds are from they have the embryo inside of it. So they're from the ovules. So fruit are good for seed dispersal. And then we have what's called double fertilization. Which means that um, there's two sperm nuclei and one fertilizes the embryo or fertilizes the egg, which turns into the zygote, which then turns into the embryo, which then turns into the plant. Um, but then the other one fertilizes the endosperm, which is a, a, a In other words, if the egg and endosperm are fertilized, And I should mention a lot of people miss on the exam. So the way fertilization happens is that first pollination happens. This is in um, angiosperms. Pollen lands on the stigma. The pollen tube grows down. And it's like one cell, uh, and the cell gets a really extended plasma membrane. And so that pollen tube grows down the style, so the stigma style, to the ovary. So it grows through the tissue and comes around. Uh, enters the ovary and there's a little entrance to where the ovules are. That's where the eggs are in the ovules. And then the sperm nuclei travel through that pollen tube. There's two of them. They end up going and uh, into the ovule. One fertilizes the egg cell. The other fertilizes the endosperm cell. Then that can um, turn into a zygote and then also then it will become a seed. That seed would then be dispersed and grow up into a new plant potentially. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know why that's missed a lot, but it's um, it is so the pollen tube goes down and the, the sperm come down to the egg, and the eggs retained in the ovary, and that ovary turns into the fruit. Okay, these groups, all of them except for the non-vascular, are vascular plants, but they're also called tracheophytes. And why is that? It's because they have xylem, which is the vascular tissue. Uh, xylem is water and minerals from the roots up to the plant, the rest of the plant. Xylem, and xylem is made of um, cells called trache tracheid cells. And you don't need to know the types for our class, but that's where the name tracheophyte comes from. Um, is made of tracheid cells, which is where the tracheophyte comes from. So that's your embryophytes. As far as fungi go, they're within Unicanta, specifically within that. Pistaconta, uh, uh, the closest relative. It's not a fun fungus, it is called a nucleoid. Oh, it's a type of protist. Single cell. So I have five major groups. Chytrids. Uh, remember those um, chytrids are the ones killing the amphibians. Okay. 
because they're colonizing their skin and preventing it from uh, exchanging gas. We know that that happens now with the amphibians. So it's a big problem. There's also plenty of other tissues as well. They're not all deadly. There's the zygomycota, zygote fungi, fungi, red molds. They have the zygospore angium, a zygospore, uh, the sexual reproductive structures. Their spore angium is their asexual reproductive structure. Uh, the lower marrow. Mycota, which are the arbuscular fungi, arbuscular means tree. They only name that because they look sort of like the branches of a tree, because they are the ones that uh, are in a, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with plant roots. They are mycorrhizae partner with plant roots. Uh, you don't need snake homorphies for these guys. Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. Ascomycota is sac fungi. Basidiomycota are club fungi. Sexual reproductive structure. Basidiomycota is basidium, basidiospores. Ascomycota is the ascus and the uh, ascospores. Uh, ascomycota includes yeast, it includes, which is a broad category of unicellular, algae, <laughs> unicellular fungi. Uh, we have um, like mushroom, mushrooms that look like they're cages. Uh, you have morels, you have um, like mushrooms that are not don't have toadstools. So a lot of those things we think of as mushrooms, but they're not, the, they don't have the cap on the top or they're not like, uh, they don't have like a flat cap, um, like shelf fungi. Those are Basidiomycota shelf fungi, classic mushroom or like classic toadstool fungi. Um, and then lichens, of course, are the mutualistic relationship between green algae and fungi, Ascomycota and, and often Basidiomycota or cyanobacteria and ascomycota, often acidiomycota, um, that mutualistic relationship there, symbiotic relationship. That's your fungi. All right, we'll draw this phylogeny of animals quickly because I already have a really, really good lecture. I already have a really good recording of drawing this that has um, lots of uh, explanation. So maybe you already know that and you just want to watch a quick one. So that's what I'll show here just to remind you. Okay. So polytomy at the beginning, because I'm not clear. These are all phyla. So if I ask you the phylum, I'm going to take one of these names. Peripheral sponges. Blackazoa. Blackazoans. Tunophora, comb jellies, tinophores, but comb jellies. Then uh, I do branch this down. Area. These are true jellies. They are sea anemones. They're box jellies. They are siphonophores or, or colonial kind of jellies, like, uh, well, they're not jellies. Daria, like um, Portuguese man of war. There are sea pens, there are sea faeons, or anything that does the skinning. Then we've got here 
your bilateria. Let's put this up. Animals, metazoa, within Conta. Specifically, a Pistaconta, like the fudge eye. And again, their closest relative, that's not an animal, are the Coleanoflagellates. Which are a type of protist. Single cell. Uh, okay, animals overall. Just do these anyway. Okay, animals overall, what do they have? They have collagen. They have some types of junctions. Collagen. Extracellular matrix, uh, you know, gap type, and uh, junctions. And desmosomes. Almost all have Hox genes. For body. Patterning. The muscle and nerve tissue. We also have that on the tenophora. Uh, unclear if it's a separate event or if it's the same event or how that or, or if it's an event back here and then it was lost to periphera and placozoa or if it was an event after periphera branched off and then lost in placozoa in any case muscle and nerve are specifically animal in your bilateria they have bilateral symmetry at some point in their life, Look that up if you don't know what that is, they uh, are triple elastic, meaning their muscles come from a layer of in a germ layer called the mesoderm during development. They are more well developed muscles than like cnidarians and tenophores, and there is cephalization. The head or anterior region collects a uh, neuron in ganglia or brains eventually, which allows a directional movement. So they actually have a head and tail so they can go in direction, uh, which allows them to hunt better as well as um, get away from being prey um, and more sensory structures. All right, then we have our groups of um, bilateria. Okay, I'll start with this one and I'll draw the rest of this in a moment. Um, okay, so we have Deuterostomia, animals two in our class. That was the unit. Oops. Mostly these are classified uh, by molecular genetics. I'm going to write that on there, but um, we have the For data, we have the Pinodermata, sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, um, sea cucumbers, basket stars, brittle stars, 
see these fixing earlies. Hemichordata, acord worms. That's the Deuterostomia. And we have our two groups here. The group that I call Spiralia Lophozoa is with our book, it refers to it. Depends how that goes down once they decide how the branching works. Maybe they won't even use either name. Okay, so we have uh, polytomy here, a bunch of different uh, branches. So in no particular order, Molesca. So you can look up the types within these. You can even look at the animal chart that we did, uh, or uh, I have a key up. These are flatworms, so some are parasitic, tapeworms, flukes, some are not, things like planaria. Analita, segmented worms like leeches, earthworms, things called polychaetes, which include uh, tube worms. Um, so we're going to come up with a plume. There are segments. Flat helmet, these are flat. They're also worm shaped, just a shape. Uh, they're calling it cinder model. Which includes rotifers, it's a more important group. Here, I guess what's this saying? Those rotifera or rotifers are not a phylum now, cindermata. Well, not now. I've seen cindermata in the past, but like our book now uses that. Uh, so rotifers are a group within that phylum. Uh, Ectoprocta, it's also called bryozoa. Those are your moss animals, the colonial, lots of tiny holes. They have these like, uh, Sort of not tentacles, it's sort of like that. And uh, you stick them out of the little holes, and so it can look sort of like moss, very small, as far as I have seen. And then you have your brachiopods. Brachio means arm, pod means foot. So these are the ones with the, like it looks like a clamshell on a stick or a stalk. So it's a stalk with a shell um, and then a, like a body. Inside of that also has these little projections like or like a ectoprocta. Um, those are called lamp shells, though, the brachiopoda. I think that's what we want to do for that. And, and this last group here. At Dysozoa. Most successful group that's the largest and most diverse are Coda insects, which are in, uh, within you got the clicerates, which are the horseshoe crabs, your spiders, your uh, scorpions, ticks, mites. Uh, millipedes, centipedes, and then arthro arthropoda, you also have the insects, you also have um, uh, crustaceans, some are more closely related to insects than they are to other crustaceans, but that's going to be like, uh, you know, lobsters, shrimp, krill, crabs, crayda uh, crayda crayfish, um, sea monkeys, and a lot of other And you also have your no.
Arthur Code is very diverse. You can see the groupings that um, in the on the lecture notes or in the table. Um, Nematoda or the roundworms, right? Cielians or also heartworms, pinworms, a lot of those kind of disease causing worms. Um, it's like tardigrada. Tardigrades or tardigrada, uh, the water bears, uh, they're the ones that can live in super extreme conditions like a vacuum or having no water for like 100 years. I don't know if that's true, but really extreme conditions and they've uh, become interesting, uh, really interesting and kind of blown up as of late because they um, are kind of cute to watch. Uh, people like to watch them on YouTube. Uh, and they're also, they want to know how they survive these extreme conditions to see if we can um, learn from that. The, the only ones you need to know the only snake more the only more workies I'm going to write on here are for Cordata. The other ones like the basic characteristics of the group. I will give you a description and then you'd have to identify the group that I'm talking about, the phylum or something underneath it. Um, at Cordata, the name comes from the notochord. There's also the dorsal um, on the back, hollow nerve We've got pharyngeal. Slits or puffs. Uh, that turn into either a feeding, um, gill feeding, or uh, gill, or parts of the neck and ear. And then you've got a post a muscular postanal tail. Most of these um, these other groups that that are the digestive system. These other groups of animals they uh, have their their anus right at the end of the tail, typically. Um, or the tail is just like an extension that's just sort of body tissue that doesn't have muscle in it at all. Where the palate does have that, you know, like we, our tail should degenerates, but during embryonic development, humans have a tail just like all the other um, chordates. Um, we'll look at something else. Okay. So these are subphyla or classes. Um, so we've got the cephalochordata or lances. I'm write the common name. We've got the urochordata or tunicates, aka sea squirts. These are both invertebrates. There are two invertebrate chordates. Then we have Mixini or hagfish. We have Petromyzontida or lamprey. Those are both vertebrates, but very minimally developed vertebrae. Our vertebral column. So if you, if you watch the last part, you can just skip through this. No record. So. 
forward. Slits. The vertebrae. Um, we also have a Hox gene duplication. Then in the lineage of animals, all the animals after this um, have jaws. They have paired fins, their limbs. And they also have a mineralized skeleton. Along this lineage here, we actually have the skeleton um, evolve into a cartilaginous skeleton. Special characteristic along that line. Those are cartilaginous fish or chondrichthys. Ichthys is always fish. Chondro is cartilage. Chondrichthys, the sharks, rays, skates, uh, chimeras, aka ratfish. Then, I guess I should say too. So, it's too early. Okay. Um, then what we have are lungs and later lung derivatives, like the swim bladder. Then the rest of the animals, when the rest of the animals went down another lineage and their common ancestor um, evolved uh, lungs, uh, as well as a bony skeleton, ossified bone. The first group to branch off of that, uh, and the one we see in the fossil record, are. The Actinoptera GI, or ray finned fish, Actino, Actin means ray. Acteroptic, uh, and Tero means wing, so ray finned fish. Uh, in this lineage, we see the lungs uh, are uh, converted or Uh, uh, adapted into being a swim ladder for regulation of uh, where they are in the water column. We have the actinesia, which is the coelacanth. These characteristics here. Now I'll have lobe fins, or let's go with this description. Odd shaped um, so with fins with broad shaped bones that are in muscle instead of just sort of like a membrane or skin like the actinopter GI ray fin fish. These are embedded in there. We also call those lobe fins. Actinesia, those coelacanths. Then we have internal mirrors, meaning the uh, nostrils connect into the um, respiratory system. 
So prior to this, there are nostrils in lots of these groups, but they're just like flat, like just little cups where they have the uh, chemoreceptors for odors or chemicals uh, in the little cup in the nostrils, but now they're going to go through. That's what internal narrows means. The group to branch off there uh, do its own thing. Dipnoi or the lungfish. Then we have our um, four limbs with digits. They also have a neck, fused pelvic girdle. Other characteristics that allow them to move onto land. These are our um, first group here. And you see, I'm trying not to go the line, go beyond because they're supposed to be lined up, but amphibians, uh, we have. Words that I call non avian. Well, really, okay, non avian reptiles, even though it actually looks something like this. Uh, here's how I'll draw it. Let me draw this as a polytomy because really like crocs are more related to birds than they are to other non-birds. So that's why we call it quote reptile, like birds have to be in reptiles. So let me just do it. Uh, it's like indicating this is indicating polyphyletic. So I'll call these non-avian reptiles. Avian or ABs is birds. What's the fan? What's the thing about birds that makes them human? Feathers. There are other characteristics of birds, but uh, that are you know bird specific. But in general, like wings, bats have wings. Insects have wings. They're quite different, but they are still wing structures. Uh, beaks, but turtles also have beaks. Um, and, uh, what else do people think of? They lay eggs, but so do the other rep, uh, a lot of the other non avian reptiles. In fact, this is important here that the amniotic egg um, slash amniotic membranes, well, there's no egg. Have mammals. So draw this. Draw this below. I'm going to just move this through here so I have a lot more room. Mammals. There are four synthomorphies. Uh, milk from mammary, mammary glands. So Milk production. Hair, which can also be called fur, but it's the same thing. Whiskers are also hair at some point in their life. We also have um, three middle hair bones. Got that from a few of the same things we've looked at in class. And they have the specialized or differentiated teeth. Uh, 
Okay, that's mammals. The group here that the mammals and the reptiles, including birds, have the amniotic egg or the amniotic membranes when they don't have an egg. Um, they're called amniotes. Okay, then we go with amphibians. So this is all the ones with uh, four limbs with digits. That's tetra, four, pods, feet, but in this case, it means limbs. We've got uh, now including, um, I'm not going to do a specific one just with dipnoid, but I'll do one with dipnoid and acnesia. And we're going to call those the lobe fins. You can also call it sarcopterygii, and you see there again, GI wing, the wings referred to um, fins in this case, sarcopterygii or lobe fins. Uh, that goes up to actinistia. Then you're going to capture actinopterygii in there as well. So now we go and see what characteristic lungs, bony skeleton. These are named for the bony skeleton. Os T. Is bony fish, but that also includes not fish. Tosti. Um, then we go up to grab to contract these as well. That whole group there has jaws. If you trace it back, you can see jaws. That's what it's named after. Napo, which means jaw, stone, which means mouth. So they're the naposomes. Then we have the two groups here that are vertebrates but not naposomes. Um, okay, so that's the Pedromyzotida and the Cini. I'm going to do this here because I want it to contrast to this. Uh, they might they sometimes might call Agnatha, but the more modern name that I'm going to use are the cyclo stones. Again, mouth, like jawless mouth. Um, so the cytostomes and napostomes are all called vertebrates. And then of course, all these are in chordata, so they're chordates. So that's your phylum chordata. Um, Pause that there if you need to. Just draw this. Major phylogeny, just so you can see that this is the exact same thing. I'm going to draw it without explaining anything, but it's the exact same thing we just drew. I'm just branching it differently. First branch, cephalochordata, second branch, urochordata, third branch here. And that has two on it. Petru, uh, Mixini petrobizontica, so the cyclostomes. And then I'm going to branch one down here. Drink these. Um, I've got my Actinopter GI. Then I have Actin means here. Then I have my diphthoid. My goodness gracious. A little small, sorry. Mammals. Let's just do reptiles, amphibians. Uh, and this is the exact same thing I just drew. We look and see, walk along, first branch, cephalocardata. That's the um, 
the last place. And then we go here, second branch, Eurocordata, tunicates. And we come here, here's the third branch, Mixenia petromyzontica, cyclostomes. And then we come here at the fourth branch is cartilaginous fit, fish, pedrictes. And then the fifth branch is Actinoptera GI, the raven fish. And then we have Actinistia, the coelacanths, and then Dipnoi, which is the lung lungfish. Then we get the tetrapods, which are amphibians, and then the amnios, which are reptiles, and then mammals. So just to let you know, I guess what I'm saying is that you can't know uh, what goes in up and down because this is exactly the same thing I just drew. Just need another branch of pattern. Okay. 